Hello, my name is Abdul Ghaffar, and I'm the director of the Campus Engagement Leadership Office here at UNC Pembroke. I'm so happy to have you tuned in to witness a true American treasure. For the first time, we're holding a Distinguished Speaker Series event virtually. There have been many firsts throughout this pandemic, but this is actually one I'm excited about. The Campus Engagement Leadership Office introduced the Distinguished Speaker Series February 7, 2000, and 2000 with Danny Glover, presenting for Black History Month. The series has been a major part of UNCP culture since, since uh, 2013. And we have had such speakers over the years as Maya Angelou, Billy Mills, Spike Lee, James Earl Jones, Diane Guerrero, Cornell West, West Studi, and so many more. Before I introduce our special guests, I want to welcome the students and staff of the UNC Wilmington Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion. We are so happy to have you with us tonight. Also, I want to recognize and welcome a young group of emerging artists from North Carolina, the Literary Changemakers, led by North Carolina Poet Laureate, Jackie Shelton Green. Later this month, Ms. Green will lead a summit of high school poets from North Carolina. I'm sure they will learn much from this presentation. Our guest is an internationally renowned performer and writer of the Muskegee Nation and was named the 23rd Poet Laureate of the United States in 2019. The author of nine books of poetry, several plays and children's books, and a memoir, Crazy Brave. Her many honors include the Ruth Lilly Prize for Lifetime Achievement from the Poetry Foundation, the Academy of American Poets Wallace Stevens Award, a Penn USA Award, Literary Award, the Leela Wallace Reader's Digest Fund Writers Award, a Rasmussen U.S. Artist Fellowship, two NEA Fellowships, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She is a Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets and is a founding board member of the Native Arts Cultures Foundation. She lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she is a Tulsa Artist Fellow. She is certainly one of the most decorated and distinguished speakers we've ever had. Please welcome the amazing Joy Harjo. I'm really happy to be here at uh, Pembroke. And um, I was, uh, I, 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 I'm honored to be included in that list of, of previous guests actually. I always run into Danny Glover in strange places. The last time I ran into him was in, and I'd met him before, was in uh, Anchorage at a little uh, restaurant, you know, breakfast place. It's a few years back. And of course, Wes Studi, I know, and, and Billy Mills and Maya Angelou. One of my first poetry readings at a university far from home was one of the first multicultural, multicultural um, events, multi, um, yeah, multicultural uh, literary events where they, we had poets from all kinds of cultures. And uh, Maya Angelou came up to me after her, after I read and said nice things to me. <laughs> so that list kind of, uh, it was a nice opening to, to, and, and to be included there. So I'm honored to be here and uh, in an important part of the country. I just wish I could be there in person, but my spirit is here with you. And I'm going to start with a, a poem that is called Calling Your Spirit Back. When we go through um, difficult times and times, challenging times, and um, sometimes we can lose ourselves. We can uh, lose parts of our spirit over moments that can be a real traumatic and um, and sometimes we need to call ourselves back. So I like to open with this sometimes because it, it kind of sets the, sets the mode. And we need it. <laughs> I think we need it in this time. We're calling the spirit back from wandering the earth in its human feet. Put down that bag of potato chips, that white bread, that bottle of pop. Turn off that cell phone, computer, and remote control. Open the door, then close it behind you. 
Take a breath offered by friendly winds. They travel the earth gathering essences of plants to clean. Give it back with gratitude. If you sing, it will give your spirit lift to fly to the stars, ears, and back. Acknowledge this earth who has cared for you since you were a dream planting itself precisely within your parents' desire. Let your moccasin feet take you to the encampment of the guardians who have known you before time, who will be here after time. They sit before the fire that has been there without time. Let the earth stabilize your post-colonial insecure jitters. Be respectful of the small insects, birds, and animal people who accompany you. Ask their forgiveness for the harm we humans have brought down upon them. Don't worry. The heart knows the way, though there may be high rises, interstates, checkpoints, armed soldiers, massacres, wars, and those who will despise you because they despise themselves. The journey might take you a few hours, a day, a year, a few years, a hundred, a thousand, or even more. Watch your mind. Without training, it might run away and leave your heart for the immense human feast set by the thieves of time. Do not hold regrets. When you find your way to the circle, to the fire kept burning by the keepers of your soul, you will be welcomed. You must clean yourself with cedar, sage, and other healing plants. Cut the ties you have to failure and shame. Let go the pain you are holding in your mind, your shoulders, your heart, the way to your feet. Let go the pain of your ancestors to make way for those who are heading in our direction. Ask for forgiveness. Call upon the help of those who love you. These helpers take many forms. Call your spirit back. It may be caught in corners and creases of shame, judgment, and human abuse. You must call in a way that your spirit will want to return. Speak to it as you would a beloved child. Welcome your spirit back from its wandering. It may return in pieces, in tatters. Gather them together. They will be happy to be found after having been lost for so long. Your spirit will need to sleep a while after it is bathed and given clean clothes. Now you can have a party. Invite everyone you know who loves and supports you and keep room for those who have no place to go. Make a giveaway and remember, keep the speeches short. Then you must do this. Help the next person find their way to the dark. Okay. I was reading Keep the Speeches Short, and I was thinking well, this poem is a little long, but <laughs> I'm actually going to read a longer one in a little, in a few, a few poems away. But um, I'll read a short one. I'm going to read This Morning I Pray for My Enemies. And uh, This Morning I Pray for My Enemies. And whom do I call my enemy? An enemy must be worthy of engagement. I turn in the direction of the sun and keep walking. It's my heart that asks the question, not my furious mind. The heart is the smaller cousin of the sun. It sees and knows everything. It hears the gnashing even as it hears the blessing. The door to the mind should only open from the heart. An enemy who gets in risks the danger of becoming a friend. Let's see. This one is called Rabbit is Up to Tricks. And uh, Rabbit keeps showing up in my books and my new newest collection an American Sunrise, a rabbit shows up at New Orleans and invents the saxophone. <laughs> Maybe I'll read that one. I might read that one, too, in a little bit. But um, this rabbit's a trickster figure. 
for Muscogee people, Muscogee Creek people, um, rabbit is a trickster figure. I think for West African people, it's rabbit. For others, it's coyote or coyote. And trickster figures are, are like clowns, and they're in the world to remind us not to take ourselves one too seriously and to pay attention. They also remind us that power doesn't belong to us. So you usually find them sitting near the seats of power or, you know, where, where the, in, near the seats of power to remind the, those wielding and holding power that, hey, this doesn't belong to you. It was given to you to share. It belongs to, to the people. You're just here to take care of it. Although, as we know in history, that sometimes, um, yeah, I think we need a lot of tricksters right now. <laughs> we have a lot of, there are a lot of tricksters maybe sitting in the places of power. Things have gotten a little turned around. Rabbit is up to tricks. In a world long before this one, there was enough for everyone until somebody got out of line. We heard it was rabbit fooling around with clay in the wind. Everybody was tired of his tricks. No one would play with him. He was lonely in this world. So Rabbit thought to make a person, and when he blew into the mouth of that crude figure to see what would happen, the clay man stood up. Rabbit showed the clay man how to steal a chicken. The clay man obeyed. Then he showed him how to steal corn. The clay man obeyed. Then he showed him how to steal someone else's wife, and that clay man obeyed. Rabbit felt important and powerful and Clay man felt important and powerful, and once that clay man started, he could not stop. Once he took that chicken, he wanted all the chickens. Once he took that corn, he wanted all the corn. And once he took that wife, well, he wanted all the wives. He was insatiable. Then he had a taste of gold. He wanted all the gold. Soon it was land or anything else he saw. His wanting only made him want more. Soon it was countries, then it was trade. The wanting infected the earth. We lost track of the purpose and meaning for life. We began to forget our songs, our stories. We can no longer see or hear our ancestors or talk with each other across the kitchen table. Forests were being mowed down all over the world to make more, and Rabbit had no place left to play. Rabbit's trick had backfired. Rabbit tried to call the clay man back, but when that clay man wouldn't listen, Rabbit realized he made a clay man with no ears. Okay, I just want to tell you guys out there, if you hear a little dings, it's something that I can, I have tried and tried to turn off and to quit. And uh, the application refuses to quit. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I thought I would read this one. It's long, it's more like a story. But I want to read it because it, it kind of gives you, it, it, there's a lesson in it before you because sometimes sometimes we'll carry around a regret that regret takes a lot of energy carrying a regret around manages sucks your energy and uh, i was working away i was working away on this book in american sunrise and i was all in this mode of on, on my father's side of my uh grandparent great grandparents and the trail of tears and that side of the family and then my mother and then um in that story of a particular trail of tears and being back and i was back in the southeast and going to all the places that uh, hold our family history and i'm sitting there in this historical mode as i research i don't know that people don't always realize and poets we research we um you know, read some people are really heavy into geology or geography. We all, it's, you know, constantly studying. I always study music and play horn instruments and always studying. We still study a lot of history. 
So I was in that mode. And then suddenly this poem came out. It's called Washing My Mother's Body. And uh, I realized what the poem taught me because, um, because they do. That's one thing I like about poetry is that you go in. It's like you go into a space and you don't know really what's going to happen. I'm not one of those kind of people that can say, well, I'm going to write a title and write a poem. It doesn't work that way. It's an exploration through time and space and so on with words and language and images. And I realized I started writing. It's just started writing itself. Like at first, it goes, I never got to wash my mother's body when she died. I returned to take care of her in memory. And so the poem is teaching me, that's how I make peace when things are left undone. I go back and open the door. And so then what started happening, this poem started to unfold like, wait a minute, I did, I felt bad because I wanted to wash my mother's body when she passed. And then other family members, no, we're going to, you know, next thing I know, they take her body away. I was really upset about it. But I, I didn't make a big deal because, you know, those moments of, there's moments, every moment is ultimately sacred, but there's moments of an incredible intimate sacredness, like at birth or at death, marriages too, when everything is heightened. And so everybody's more tender. So there was a tenderness around my mother and the family when she passed. And you guys, nobody should be arguing over stuff when, you know, you know, if somebody's even laying there, you know, about ready to people, they can hear you. You know, even when they're gone, they can hear you. So there was this moment I thought, I'm not going to argue with them and say, no, leave her body here. What are you doing? Da, 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 da. I said, no. Okay. So I didn't get to wash her body. But here, a few years later, and I'm doing it in a poem. I finally get to take care of that regret in a poem. And you can do that. Poems are useful. You don't have to be a poet to write a poem. But um, it's it's a useful place to go in. And, and, and you might want to do that. If, some, if there's something you regret, you can go and find language. You could even use that. Use the beginning. I never got to da-da-da-da-da. I never got to talk to you, Dad, and tell you that, you know, the last time I saw you, we fought, and now you're gone, and, you know, and, you know, I'm I'm going a little crazy here, I'm smoking too much, da-da-da-da, just say, I never got to, and then say what you need to say, because they will hear you. So this poem is a little long after I said, keep the speeches short, <laughs> but it's a story, and yeah, there's a story in it, there's lots of stories, um, watching my mother's body. I never got to wash my mother's body when she died. I returned to take care of her in memory. That's how I make peace when things are left undone. I go back and open the door. I step in to make my ritual, to do what should have been done, what needs to be fixed, so that my spirit can move on, so that the children and grandchildren are not caught in a knot of regret they do not understand. I find the white enamel pan she used for bread and biscuits. It's the same pan she used to bathe us in when we were babies. I turn the faucet on and hold my hand under the water until it is warm, the temperature one uses to wash an infant. I find a clean washcloth and a stack of washcloths. She had nothing in her childhood. She made sure she had plenty of everything when she grew up and made her own life. Her closets were full of pretty dresses, so many she had not the time to wear them all. They were bought by the young girl who wore the same flower sack dress to school every day. The one she had to wash out every night and hang by the to dry, hang up to dry by the wood stove. I pick up the bar of soap from her sink, the same soap she used yesterday morning to wash her face. When she looked in the mirror, did she know it would be her last sunrise? I move over pill bottles, a clock radio on the table by the bed, a pen and set down the pan. I straighten the blankets over her to keep her warm for dignity. I start with her face. Her face is unlined even two months before her 80th birthday. She was known for her beauty, and when younger passed for the Cherokee that she was through her mother and her mother's mother, all the way back to time's beginning. My mother had the iron pot given to her by her Cherokee mother, whose mother gave it to her given to her by the U.S. government on the Trail of Tears. 
She grew flowers in it. As I wash my mother's face, I tell her how beautiful she is, how brave, her, how her beauty and bravery live on in her grandchildren. Her face is relaxed, peaceful. Her earth memory body has not left yet. But when I see her the next day embalmed in the casket in the funeral home, it will be gone. Where does it go? It is heavier than the spirit who lifted up and flew. I think of it making the rounds to every place it has loved to say goodbye. Goodbye to the house where I brought my babies home, she sings. Goodbye to June's bar where I was the shuffleboard queen. I cannot say goodbye yet. I will never say goodbye. I lift up each arm to wash, her hands still wear her favorite rings. She loved her body and she decorated it with shiny jewelry, with creams and makeup. I am tender over the scar, the burn scar on her arm where, from when she cooked at the place with the cruel boss who insisted she reach her hand into the friolator to clean it. She had protested it was still hot and suffered a deep burn. That scar always reminded me of her coming in from working long hours in restaurants, her uniform drenched with sweat, determination, and exhaustion. Once she came home and I was burning up with a fever. She pulled out the same pan. I am dipping the washcloth in now. Only she's added rubbing alcohol to bring the fever down. She washes tenderly, tells me about how her friend Chunky left her husband again, how she knows her old boss, a Jewish woman who treated her kindly, has cancer. She doesn't know how she knows, she just knows. She doesn't tell me that. I find it in a journal she has left me, a day book in which she has written notes for me to find when she is gone. I wash her neck and lift the blankets to move down her heart. I thank her body for carrying us through the rough story, through the violence of my father and her second husband. Her mother's mother died when she was born, and her, adopt, her adoptive mother, another Cherokee woman, had no love in her heart for a tiny girl whose light hair betrayed her Indianness, unlike the baby's older, darker sister who would stay within her circle. Because my mother's, because her mother was not there for her, my grandmother did not know how to mother my mother. The story is all there in her body as I wash her to prepare her to be let down into earth and return all stories to the earth. My body memories rise as I wash. I recall carrying my two children, rocking them and feeding them from my body. How I knew myself as beloved earth in that body. I uncover my mother's legs. I remember the varicose veins that swelled like rivers when my mother would get off a long shift. They carried more than a woman should carry. A woman should be honored like a queen. Traditionally, we treated our women with that kind of respect, my Creek husband tells me. Ha, I laugh and ask him, then why aren't you cooking my dinner? I wash her feet and caress them. You will have some rest now, I tell my mother. Even as I know, my mother was never one for resting. I cover her. I make the final ring of the washcloth and drape it over the pan. I brush my mother's hair and kiss her forehead. I ask the keepers of the journey to make sure her travel is safe and sure. I ask the angels, whom she loved and with whom she spoke frequently, to take her home. But wait, not before I find her favorite perfume. <coughs> Then I sing her favorite song softly. I don't know the name of the song, just a few phrases. One of those old homemade heartbreak songs where there's a moment of happiness wound through. And then I let her go. That's from my mother. Let's see. I think I will read. I'm going to read Mystic. I travel a lot and a lot of my poems take place in different places. 
I was in Misty, Connecticut, walking around, and you can feel things that have happened sometimes, and there are stories everywhere. And um, I was walking around, and here was a story. I was standing, well, every place has a story, every rock, every, there's stories everywhere. And this is one of the stories I found in Mystic. I also found incredible other stories about uh, water and ocean. I love boats and water. But this story, I couldn't leave until I um, made note of it. In Mystic, my path is a cross of burning trees lit by crows carrying fire in their beaks. I ask the guardians of these lands for permission to enter. I'm a visitor to this history. No one remembers to ask anymore, they answer. What do I expect in this New England seaport town near the birthplace of democracy, where I am a ghost? Even a casino can't make an Indian real. Or should I say native or savage or demon? And with what trade language? I am trading a backwards look for jeopardy. I agree with the ancient European maps. There are monsters beyond imagination that troll the waters. The Puritans determined ships did fall off the edge of the world. I'm happy to smell the sea, walk the narrow winding streets of shops and restaurants and delight in the company of friends, trees and small winds. I would rather not speak with history, but history came to me. It was dark before daybreak when the fire sparked. The men left on a hunt from the Pequot village, here where I stand. The women and children left behind were set afire. I do not want to know this, but my gut knows the language of bloodshed. Over 600 were killed to establish a home for God's people, crowed the Puritan leaders in their Sunday sermons. And then history was gone in a betrayal of smoke. They are still burning, though we live in a democracy erected over the burial ground. This was given to me to speak. Every poem is an effort at ceremony. I ask for a way in. It's interesting how timely that poem is, how people can get so in their beliefs, they forget that we're human beings, or that they're human beings too. And we all have uh, a right to our our belief systems, our, our um, religion, there's room for a diversity. I mean, this whole, you go to the natural world, that's what the old people taught me, was that you go into the natural world, and that's where you learn about balance and how to live and, and diversity, diversity of languages, of uh, peoples, of belief systems. Um, okay. Let's see. I wanted to, uh, this anthology just came out. Its birthday was yesterday. It's called When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. And uh, I know the type is backwards for you, but the image is by Emmy Whitehorse. And it's a Norton anthology, the first Norton anthology of Native poetry, after all these years, uh, called uh, Norton Anthology of Native Nations Poetry. Several editors, they insisted on putting my name in bigger, but the three central editors are Leanne Howe, who's Choctaw, Jennifer Elise Forrester, who's also Muscogee Creek. And um, then we had a whole team of, of experts. They're experts. Yeah, they are experts, all Native poets, which I think is unusual for a Norton anthology. Usually the... Uh, these anthologies are put together by many of these people are also scholars too, but um, these are native poets put this anthology together. And then I had help from students. I was teaching at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and my grad students. I have a had a team of we had a team of assistant editors, and we made sure they were listed in here too, who assisted in putting this together. So uh, it was quite a journey with all of us. And um, so I'm going to read, I'm going to read a poem from here. I'm going to read this from Moses Jumper. Moses is, um, Jumper is, Moses Jumper Jr. is, uh, 
Seminole. His mother knew my great grandfather, who is loved and respected by the Seminole people because um, he used to come from Oklahoma. And uh, my family, uh, my father's side, they were, uh, they had oil money from oil discovery. They didn't like it that my father married my mother, who was poor. As you can tell, that poem for her, she was, she grew up poor. And my father came from speakers and tribal leaders and so on. And they weren't happy about the marriage. But um, anyway, my grandparents, great grandparents used to um, go to spend part of half the year in uh, down in Seminole country. And she knew him. And that made me, that was just so exciting to speak to somebody who knew my great grandfather who was gone. And uh, he's one of my mentors, even though he was gone before I was here. Uh, just like some of the, you know, we have ancestors in our field. You have mathematics ancestors. There's poetry ancestors, just like we have familial ancestors. Some of them you are close to, and some of them, some ancestors you just want to stay away from. <laughs> you know, they, they don't change. Anyway, I love that Betty, you know, Moses' mother knew my great-grandfather. And I, I love this poem of his because it takes you right out to the land because it's a place of knowledge. It's called Simplicity by Moses Jumper Jr. The small tunnel which the rabbit uses for escape and travel. The small imprints of the killdeer in the soft white sand near the pond. The fragileness of the newborn doves and how the mother puts on an act to lure away approaching enemies. The unity of the small minnows as they protect themselves by staying near the shoreline of the stream. The clear whistling sound the scorpion makes to let one know he's near. The shagginess of the owl's nest and the nearness of the hummingbirds. The long graceful jumps of the sleek green frog. The short choppy hops of the lumpy toad. The agileness and grace of the otter the awkward wing flapping of the crane, the camouflage nest of the mobile alligator and the will to reach the water of her young, the winding tunnels that lead to nowhere of the sly red fox, the abundance of life in the wet season and stench of death in the dry, the persistence of the mother hawk to nudge her young to make that flight. I saw all these things and many more, and I know they were right. So that poem also gives you a structure to make a poem. It's to start naming all the things that you see. And what is it out of, what does it teach you? No matter where you are, you know, what is it showing you? Anyway, this poem has over a hundred, I think 161 poets, I think 90 something nations, different tribal nations. And it goes from time immemorial all the way to the youngest poets. I think Jake Skeets is one of the youngest poets in Navajo. So this is just out. Let's see, do I have time for maybe one or two more, I think? Uh, let's see. I probably shouldn't read two rabbit poems in the same always have a rowdy. I always make sure I have something rowdy. And then I tell you that, and then I'm not going to read it. Okay. I'm just going to read this one. Maybe I'll end with this one called uh, How to Write a Poem in a Time of War. And... Uh, I was standing out, I, I took a job at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And, um, one is that my interview, I had, a, I had eight interviews. <laughs> I had eight interviews to do when I went down there for the job and I had a good time. I knew it was a good thing when I had a good time at every interview. And that was our, our relationship. And I loved being there with the students and the faculty. It was really a wonderful place. And I also went there, my husband and I, he's also on Muskogee Creek, to be in farther into the south. And we went to all of these places. That I even found a house owned by an uncle still in Columbus, Georgia, down there, uh, Patty Carr, and who used to own the largest horse race track on the east, eastern seaboard. 
And, you know, there's all these stories that we get so stereotyped into non-human images, and yet we're all kinds of people. You know, my father and mother are both Native, but very different stories and different histories, you know. And uh, anyway, I remember knowing that we were going to leave, and I thought, how ironic. I come back to the homeland. I come home. And now I'm going back to the place we didn't want to go to. But then it's also, it was painful to be in our home and know that we weren't there, that we had been totally wiped out of the place, even the history in some instances. So um, I was wondering, and so I remember standing out and looking at the trees, knowing I was going to leave, and my spirit asked, what did you learn here? And then I went and sat down and I started this poem and it starts with, you can't begin just anywhere. It's a wreck. And that's what started this whole book in American Sunrise. You can't begin just anywhere. It's a wreck. Shrapnel in the eye of a house, a row of houses. There's a rat scrambling from light with fleshy trash in its mouth. A baby strapped to its mother's back, cut loose. Soldiers crawl the city, the river, the town, the village, the bedroom, our kitchen. They eat everything or burn it. They kill what they cannot take. They rape what they cannot kill. They take. Rumors fall like rain, like bombs, like mother and father tears swallowed for restless peace. Like sunset slanting toward a moonless midnight, like a train blown free of its destination, like a seed fallen where... There is no chance of trees or any place for birds to live. No, start here, deer peer from the edge of the woods. We used to see woodpeckers the size of the sun and were greeted by chickadees with their good morning songs. We'd started to cook outside, slippery with dew and laughter. Ah, these smoky sweet sunrises. We tried to pretend war wasn't going to happen though they began building their houses all around us and demanding more. They started teaching our children their God's story, a story in which we'd always be slaves. No, not here. You can't begin here. This is memory shredded because it is impossible to hold with words, even poetry. These memories were left here with the trees, the torn pocket of your daughter's hand-sewn dress, the sash, the lace. The baby's delicately beaded moccasin still connected to the foot, a young man's note of promise to his beloved. No, this is not the best place to begin. Everyone was asleep, despite the distant bombs. Terror had become the familiar stranger. Our beloved twin girls curled up in their nightgowns next to their father and me. If we begin here, none of us will make it to the end of the poem. Someone has to make it out alive, sang a grandfather to his grandson, his granddaughter, as he blew his most powerful song into the hearts of the children. Jiholta Jazari. There it would be hidden from the soldiers who would take them miles, rivers, and mountains from the naval court place of the origin story. Gina, oh, 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 oh. He knew one day, far day, the grandchildren would return. Generations later, over slick highways, constructed over to old trails, through walls of laws meant to hamper or destroy, over stones bearing libraries of the winds. Plakari, momais. He sang us back to our home place from which we were stolen in these smoky green hills. Yes, begin here. Oh, watch can oh, oh, obey. Your God leads. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, amazing. I, I'm speechless. <laughs> Fortunately, um, 
we have some questions that some people have submitted and I'd like to share them with you. We have about maybe five questions. So take as much time as you'd like to answer. I want to thank our um, UNC Pembroke American Indian Studies uh, Department for co-sponsoring this event, along with the Museum of the Southeast American Indian located here at UNC Pembroke and our English Literature and Foreign Languages um, Department, who are all very excited to have you with us. We were, it was a team effort to be able to pull this off. And after seeing uh, your presentation, I, I fully understand why you were recommended by those departments and very happy that, that we were able to, to do this. So with that, I'd like to uh, ask you a couple of questions. And our first question is from a recent UNCP alumnus named Des Woods. And his question is, as someone who tours the nation, how do you dismantle stereotypes of indigenous Americans? You. I think that even um, being named the U.S. Poet Laureate helped dispel a lot of stereotypes because and now I have an anthology I can point to and say, there are a lot of us. It's, there's not just me. And we're all kinds of people. We're, we're human beings. And I remember when I first started writing, I was a student at the University of New Mexico and the key, I was a member of the Kiva Club, which was a native student club, and we had a lot of students, and we began social justice, and we started working for our native rights and social justice movements. And I remember thinking, and I started writing then, um, I was always the quietest person and sat in the back, and writing became a way of expressing what I couldn't say, and also being, you know, expressing us, you know, as women, you know, our experience and, and so on during that time. And I remember thinking if my work, I didn't know I was going to be a poet then, I was all, I was going to be a painter. And, uh, but I remember thinking, if I do anything else, which I would have done with a painting too, is I want people to know that we're human beings. You know, we're human beings. We, we aren't just these thin images that for the most part have nothing to do with us. And we're so many different tribal nations, cultures and languages and, and, uh, and uh, science, different scientific, different scientific methods and stories and so on. So I think traveling about, I've been traveling about long before that position. I mean, I've been traveling about, I started performing. I was the least likely person to perform, I'm sure, but when I was an undergrad, I was one of the featured poets in our series, along with another student. And uh, it's taught me a lot, but part of it is traveling about the country and a lot in Indian country, which I always love going into native communities, meeting with native student clubs and, and uh, you know, as well as with everyone else. And, and in a way, I mean, my work is about the arts and so on, but it's also about about that kind of that promise I made to myself that my work would be about showing people that, you know, that one, that America is Indian country and that it's where the root, we're part of the, we're the roots of this country. There would be no America without us. And um, the story, we're always part of the story, whether we're never mentioned, you know, that we're, we're always, we're here and, and, America, if America is going to heal, then our stories have to be included. Thank you. Um, so we have a UNCP senior, Jeremiah Kelly, wanted to ask as a writer, how do you work with deadlines? And when you reach writer's block, if that actually ever happened to you, I couldn't believe it did. <laughs> What's the best cure for writer's block if you did have it? Okay. Now that first question again was, I guess, started getting stuck in writer's block. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Deadlines, working with deadlines. Yeah. Deadlines are good. I mean, you'll get things done. And, and then once you get out of, once you get out of school, I mean, you've, in your school, you got deadlines, you got assignments that you have to get in and so on. But I make my own mainly because I'm interested in doing things. So, um, and as far as um, 
So it has to do with discipline. And then sometimes I've learned if something feels really huge and overwhelming, I break it down into little steps. And then I write out a schedule. If I find if I write things down, they tend to happen. So be careful what you write down. But <laughs> yeah. but I, I've learned that over the years. And as far as writer's block, what I have found is that it usually means that I'm going in the wrong direction or that there's something else I need and I'll put it aside. I'll put something aside and work on something else. And uh, I was asked this question last night with two of my other editors and J Jennifer gave a really good answer, Jennifer Forrester. She said she looks at other art. She might go to uh, uh, an art uh, exhibit, a painting exhibit, or go see a dance performance. You, you take yourself out of that art of you know writing and go somewhere else for inspiration. She said she even, I thought this was interesting, gives herself exercises to do. Going to those places that wind up as writing exercises. So I like the way that she gave us something concrete. But uh, do I experience it? Well, I guess what I do is put down one project and pick up another when I get there. And sometimes what I have learned is it's just not time. My worst, okay, I, I get things in pretty much on time or I wouldn't be sitting here with you. Or nor would have I accomplished what I've accomplished. But when I did my memoir, Crazy Brave, it was 14 years late. I shouldn't tell you that. <laughs> but I did other books in the meantime and so on. And I didn't know it was that late. But I did get it in. And uh, But generally, I just, I don't know, I, I just find deadlines helpful. And I make my, I make my own. But writer's block, sometimes you just have to, sometimes you start over, right? I let go a whole project once because it just wasn't working. You know, it wasn't working. And I didn't feel like what I did was a loss because I used the skills. There was something I learned in the process of working on a poem all summer that I had a notebook about this thick without all the drafts. It never worked. But, you know, I, I learned something in that process. Um, one of our students from UNC Wilmington, senior Martina Liddy, whose dad is going to help me with this project. So I'm very thankful to Michael. But um, did you have to deal with uh, workshops that critiqued your poems from an unhelpfully white lens? And were there ways you took care of yourself in order to protect your style and your craft? Oh, yeah. You know, I was, I came up, my undergrad was at University of New Mexico, and I was an art major until I had to take, go an extra, I had to go five years because I changed my major. I had almost all of my hours in studio art, then I went, became a poet, and I went to workshops, but there people were very helpful. Um, the thing that off, I've learned that often isn't is other students criticize, critiquing your work. You know, especially students who don't have a lot of, you know, who aren't, um, don't have a good sense of poetry, <laughs> you know, critiquing your work. But I did run into it and in, I went to the University of Iowa, the writing program there. And it almost silenced me. And I was there with, that's how Sandra C. Snarls and I became friends, is at the writer's workshop. Because we were coming from places that it didn't intersect with the majority culture that was going on and at the writer's workshop. Rita Dove was there too, she was a year ahead of us. And so we started meeting with others. We made our own, what we call the Third World Writer's Workshop. And we started meeting, uh, we did our own workshops because I know what happened to me is I started trying to fit in or to write like everybody, it wasn't working and it was killing poetry for me. So you have to find your way. And, and the thing with any workshop is that you you take what's useful and you let the rest go. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it's your it's your work. But it's important to always be open for learning wherever. But yes, I found that I was I felt really alone there. There were only seven native students at the University of Iowa then. And uh, it was, um, it was difficult, but I think I grew from that. It helped me 
um, it gave me a perspective. You know, and then I have a lifelong friendship with Sandra from that. But yeah, some of the, it was, uh, it's like speaking a different language sometimes. It did, it felt like we were speaking a different language. So my, my suggestion would be, you know, find your circle. And now with the internet and online, you can find, you know, it's easier to connect with people, you know, all over. You just make your own circle and, and develop from there. Many uh, young people are sort of seeking their path when they get to college or maybe before, even just after. And I know that it's difficult sometimes to know what your path is. So obviously you're fantastic at what you do. How did you find your path and how would you recommend that young people find their path in life patiently? Yeah, that's what my book Crazy Brave is about. You know, I started out, I didn't always take, I didn't take the easiest road. I wound up as a teenage mother and I uh, came from a difficult household. And then I came to an Indian arts college. It was a high school then that saved my life. And then here I wound up as a teenage mother living on nothing, you know, squirrels and commodity cheese in uh, uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma, the Cherokee capital, west of the Mississippi. And um, I didn't know I was going to get out of that, really. But, um, you know, we I've always felt, you know, it always felt like there was a map. I just didn't always see it. And I always, if I went out into nature, I could always hear, I could more easily hear in my spirit. And, um, you know, we all have... We all have, um, I think, a sensor. It's in our heart. The whole story is in our heart. But um, it's there. Sometimes it can be hard to know what your path is, especially when you're so distracted. I mean, it was bad enough when we had just phones <laughs> and then cell phones. And the next thing you know, we've got Internet. And then the next thing you know, not only do we have cell phones and Internet, we've got cell phones with internet, with texting, and then these constant dings like the ones earlier. Um, we have to disengage from that to be able to hear, to be able to hear and to know, you know, where to go. I know too, at least what I've noticed is that um, I think because of these times we're in, a lot of people are, you know, even people more my own, you know, all ages are feeling a little disoriented and even fearful. But we cannot give in to that. You have to find something that, that you love to do and, and cultivate that. Cultivate knowledge. Cultivate your spirit. You know, your spirit needs food. That's why I always say we don't just need, I remember coming up in elementary school and they'd say, well, you need food. These are the basics. You cannot live if you don't have food, clothing, or shelter. You know, a little infant can die if it doesn't have touching. If it's not touched, something dies. Or if you don't have beauty. Or, you know, we also need not just, I think, to live. We also need art. We need that that feeds our spirits. So it's important in all of this that you feed your spirit. Poetry is a way to do that. You know, the arts, the natural world. And just listening, just listening to somebody else with, with nothing distracting you, but just listening, listening to somebody's story and helping them out. You know, that will, that will help you find your path. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, so our office is um, a leadership office, and we also talk a lot about social justice as does some of our other offices on campus, like our our CCE office, there's other offices that, that emphasize social justice and, and leadership. So I wanted to ask you um, your feelings about how to become a leader, because obviously you found your path to becoming a leader. And I heard you speak earlier about social ju justice and, and sort of making a difference. So how do you um, recommend that young people, what does leadership mean to you 
and what is social justice and, and, and fighting for what's right. What does that mean to you and how can students do that? I know when I was a student and they would talk about leadership this or that, I never felt myself included because I didn't feel like a leader. But I've come to uh, to believe that everyone is ultimately. You're, you're the, whether you want to believe it or not, you are the leader of your own story. And leadership qualities is about everyone. Because you'll be leading, you know, you have your own story. You'll be, you know, maybe leading a family, uh, leading a particular event. You know, it's, and what leadership is, is really, it's, it's, it's somebody who listens. Really, that's what it is, is somebody who listens and is able to then uh, find a way to articulate and take action and work towards leaving something, not to just taking, but sharing and leaving something behind so that um, so that you're not just taking and taking and taking. That was all of our questions. Um, I wanna thank you for just an incredibly enlightening evening. Um, I'm so excited to, uh, to share this with our audience and and others and it's been I knew it was going to be good but even better than I could have expected so I've learned so much listening to you also learned that we share the University of Tennessee uh -huh. uh, so yeah I, I spent some time there too so it's awesome but um we want to thank you very much for being with us and we look forward to hearing more from you and um thank you again from UNC Pembroke Okay, thank you, Mado. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this, and I look to the forward to the time we can meet in person. Thank you very much.